All right, let's give everybody a couple more minutes and get started. We did not have a, a quiz other than putting the buzzword in this go round, so we'll jump right into the homework once we've given people a, a minute or two to, to log in. Um, all right, so this will be um, the, the live Q&A for Module 7, our last live Q&A for the course. I appreciate everybody sticking it out and then participating and doing all the things that we've been doing with risk calcs. So for Homework 7, we were asked to do, uh, use RMC SQRA calcs and to um, use the data given in the homework file uh, to do the SQRA style calculations. So I've got the homework file uh, over here on the right, and then I've got a fresh version of uh, the toolbox pulled up. So let's get started. So it looks like we've got some, we got an overtopping um, information for our annual exceedance probability, some exposure, weights, uh, consequences, and then the uh, risk estimates for all the different potential failure modes. So we will start, this is for a levy, and we're told that we're going to be making an NFIP recommendation. So we're going to start on the levy overtopping life risk tab. Make that a little smaller. All right, so in step one, we've got a spot to put our exposure rates and then the pull in some data related to our overtopping event, overtopping depths, the annual exceedance probability, and then we've got breach life loss and non-breach life loss. So we will start with our exposure rate. Uh, we're told that the day scenario is 10 hours in a day, so our rate will be 10 divided by 24. And then our nighttime exposure will be 1 minus that, or 14 over 24. Okay. So then from there, I've got my uh, overtopping data here. I can pull, looks like the event descriptions all match. I've got incipient overtopping, one foot, one and a half, incremental, and max flood loading. So I can grab these depths right here, and copy those over, and then paste his values right here. And then I also have the annual exceedance probabilities for each of those. So I'll grab all of those and then paste those in here. So I'm sure what you found as we went through this, most of this homework is just making sure we're copying and pasting things in the right place. And then the tool does the vast majority of the work for us. All right, so next step, I need my uh, breach consequences. That's gonna come from this um, first consequence table here, I've got life loss estimates for both day and night. And in the notes, it's telling me that we have a specific scenario that was developed for incipient overtopping. I, I call that out because that's not always going to be the case. A lot of times, at least in the products that the core puts together, there won't be an incipient overtopping run. So when you don't have one of those, you're going to want to use the life loss that pertains to basically our first uh, overtopping depth that was analyzed. So you see how in the spreadsheet those are set up to be the same. Uh, but in our case, uh, we do have a specific scenario that was run, so we can copy these, and we'll paste those as values here. And then the spreadsheet will calculate the exposure weighted average for us in column H. So then we'll repeat that step, but uh, for the non-breach life loss, uh, at incipient overtopping, that's always going to be zero. So scrolling down over here, I'm going to pick everything but the first one, and then we will paste that as values here. I'm not sure where there it comes. Okay. So then the spreadsheet will calculate the incremental life loss, and it will also do um, It'll, it'll plot those curves and see where um, the breach and non-breach um, 
to see whether or not they um, converge. So one thing that you will might have noticed, um, this plot isn't pulling in quite right. The reason for that is we've got a worksheet name of levy overtopping life risk, and up here it's listed as levy overtopping life risk ex extra, that's for extrapolation. So that's a holdover from the last version, I'm pretty sure. This formula works, but it, it's because cell A5 doesn't update, it's not pulling the right worksheet name. So the simplest way is to click in the formula and hit enter, and then that'll pull the right worksheet name, and then you can then use these drop downs to change the plot scale and check out our plot and see where everything shakes out. So you can see how those how the breach and non-breach life loss converge there. Um, so from there, that should be the last input that we need on this. Oops. Let's go back. I'm sorry. So that gets us um, the things we need for estimating the uh, overtopping non-breach risk. And the result should look something like that with an average annual life loss of 4.4 times 10 to the 9 is 1. And our plot would look something like this. So then the next step is going to be to pull in the system response curve for the um, overtopping with breach scenario. And that's at the bottom of the homework file down here. So I will copy the um, overtopping depth, which go out to a foot and a half. And I'll paste its values here. And then I'm going to pull the probabilities here. Paste those in right here. Now some of you noticed, let's see if this will pull up, that this plot is not plotting correctly. You'll notice that we go up to a foot and a half of overtopping where our system response probability should be one, but at least in this plot, it's stopping right at 0.9. So that is an error in the spreadsheet. And if you want to fix that, you go all the way down to the bottom here in rows 343 and 344. You'll notice this is the data that that plot is pulling from. You'll notice that the 1.3 feet of overtopping gets repeated as does its probability. So the easiest way to fix that would be to highlight these two values in column F and then drag them over. And now it's pulling the right data where we have a foot and a half and a system response probability of one. So we scroll back up, that should fix our plot, which it does. So now it goes up to one. I've um, I sent an email to the developer to go ahead and fix those two errors that we've just come through. It's nothing that impacts any of the calculations, but we definitely want our plots to be correct. So that'll fix those. All right, so scrolling down in the next step, the toolbox does the incremental risk calculations for uh, the overtopping, both annual probability of failure and average annual life loss. And then if all was said and done, we should get an overtopping plot that looks something like that. So I'll pause there. Any, any questions on uh, the inputs for the first worksheet? All right, so then we're gonna follow basically the same procedure, except a lot of this stuff is already gonna be brought in for us for the economic risk. It already pulls the overtopping events, the depths, and the average exceedance probabilities. So we just need to pull in the economic cost. Um, it's not formatted in a way that's super helpful. So I'm copying and pasting the um, breach and non-breach economic loss out here to the side. So then I can then just set uh, cells equal to those values and then kind of drag it down. So I'm going to pull the breach values in here. No. 
and then the non-breach values in the table below it. Not the right one, let's try again. Yeah. All right, so from there, again, the toolbox will do the incremental calculation for us. Uh, we have, a, have the choice of um, extrapolating the incremental flood limit. Um, Let's go ahead and change this plot so we can get a little bit better look and see if we should or shouldn't. Um, again, basically what it's doing is it's, it's carrying it out until we get to, a, to basically where those two converge. And whether we do or not, uh, in this example, it really doesn't make much difference. Um, the correct choice is yes, though, because we want to extend that out to figure out where the breach and non-breach um, intersect, otherwise we would just be using the, the maximum value that was input. This is one of the few times that we would want to extrapolate. All right, and then from there, the toolbox will do the non-breach risk calculations for us. We should get an average annual economic cost of 1.43 times 10 to the six dollars per year and our plot should look something like this. Questions on that? Damon, we... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Or was first. No. Uh, the, uh, the plot, when you change that y-axis maximum, would you show that again, please? And that's all I have. So all I did was I, I expanded that out I made it, I think it was at 10 to the, uh, 10 to the nine. Check. I changed it to 10 to the yep. 10, just so that the scale would be high enough so we could see the whole plot. That's all. Perfect. Yep, that, that fixed it. Thank you. It helped me when I changed it from scientific notation to uh, currency value so I could see all the zeros. Um, I, I, I can imagine, I agree. Um, um, I, so I just had a couple things. Uh, these are really minor things, but just things I wrote down to note for maybe future versions of the class. Um, and it, it actually going back to the uh, overtopping life risk worksheet, um, I kind of noted that in the in the uh, presentation video, what's shown as step two, I think, is actually now step three in in the spreadsheet, or maybe it had been updated. So so that. That step three is actually shown as step two in the video. I think they may have, maybe they updated the spreadsheet recently and it, the video wasn't updated accordingly. Um, and then, and then um, on the economic worksheet, um, if you're, I guess you're supposed to use drop downs, but if you're trying to copy and paste from One, two, the, the homework three. file to the, um, to the, to the SQRA calcs worksheet, um, there's some merged cells in this in the SQ RMC SQRA calcs worksheet, but the homework spreadsheet doesn't. So it's a little, it takes a little finagling to copy and paste. So maybe, yeah, you know, yeah. So I don't know if that's something like it would make it. I guess it would be easier if you mer like had merged cells to match, so it was easier to copy and paste. I guess just yeah, just to know, that, 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 that's you a good know. point. Yeah. We can we can certainly do that, and that would make it easier. Um, I'll write that down and update the homework yeah, file I mean, for next time. Yeah, it's that it's not much work to to finagle it, but it is like one extra thing. So you know, it would be if the spreadsheet if the homework file matches it, then it you know it's it would probably gotcha. be easier. Understood. No, I, I appreciate the feedback. Any other questions before going into the yes, incremental life risk table? Yeah, go ahead. So uh, you talk about the uh, convergence of the breach and non-breach. Mm -hmm. uh, that only needs to happen enough to get the correct or a reasonable shape for the incremental. And the convergence happens way after the, the peak. Uh, what's the meaning of the convergence? And I, 
like you said, it, it didn't matter for this. What, what's the meaning, what does convergence mean that if it doesn't happen, we don't like it? So you, you get to a point where you're non, if, if things fill up on the levee side, you get to a point where you get big enough flood that whether it breaches or not, you're gonna have the same amount of damages or life loss potentially. So in estimating the, again, the non-breach and the incremental, we wanna take that all the way out to figure out what that limit actually is. And in some cases, these will, you know, they won't converge, sometimes they will. And we wanna make sure that, you know, we're being faithful to the data that we're given. So in other words, if we don't, if we yes. don't extend out to where they intersect, we could be overestimating the um, the breach life loss for overtopping if we don't have enough points. Okay, so and that's because the, we only estimate for the levied areas being filled, uh, which seems reasonable. But this gets to the question I had coming coming into this. Uh, if you include breach and non-breach, you're double counting the overtopping. And so they choose uh, to incorporate overtopping without breach. But then they have to assume that the flood introduces enough water to get way up at the peak of, of these graphs. And conceptually, they have to get so much water into the levied area that it fills up. Is that pretty much reasonable nationwide? I'm, I'm trying to understand what your question is. Like you, you have to get enough water over the overtopping without breach to match the volume of water uh, for the breach. You're getting to the same levied area as you would for a breach. And then your economic consequences are or your consequences either way are, are what they are. But the, the counting of risk assumes or, or relies on incorporating the overtopping without breach, which seems like as often as not, you can get overtopping and a whole bunch of water in the levied area, but not enough to get to the, uh, worst case condition. And so that, that you would be undercounting or you'd be modeling the extremist events. Oh. So you're only double counting if you incorporate uh, failure and without I failure. I think what you're getting at is the annual probability of inundation. Is that what you're getting at? The the total risk calculation where you exclude the overtopping with failure. That's yeah. So I'm so saying. that that so when we're going through that, what we're trying to calculate is the annual probability of inundation, not necessarily the annual probability of failure. So whether the levy overtops and breaches or overtops and does not breach, I'm still flooding the levied area. So right. when we're doing the depth it for of water is very different, isn't it? And the warning times and the consequences in general. Um, it would be, but again, it's it's not about whether or not the levee fails or not. It's about whether or not water gets there. And once you start getting to a high enough depth of overtopping, that area is going to fill up whether you've reached it or not. It's not like you've got a reservoir where you know something that you can drain. The river is going to okay. continue to provide that water, so you're going to get to the timing is going to be different, but you're going to get to a similar amount of inundation. Okay, thank you. That's that was the question. Does that, I could does that help? Okay, very good. All right, so from here, we're ready to move on to the uh, tab for the total incremental life risk, and those failure modes and inputs are at the bottom of the homework file. Um, the first question that's asked in this worksheet is, is overtopping with breach non-credible, such that we would want to take the annual probability of failure for overtopping to be equal to zero? We know that we have an overtopping failure mode, so we'll leave that as no. 
and that way we've got overtopping with breach included in our matrix and then within our calculations. So then from here, we need to pull in the different failure modes. So we can copy the failure mode descriptions and paste those into column A. And then from here, we're going to go through and we'll, we have to pick our range for both um, annual probability of failure and average life loss. So this first one goes from 3 times 10 to the minus 6 to 3 times 10 to the minus 5. 3 minus 6 to the minus 5. Second one is 1 times 10 to the minus 5 to minus 4. And then we got a minus 3 times 10 to the minus 6 again. And then 1 times 10 to the minus 7. And then finally, one starting with 3 times 10 to the minus 8. So that should be all of our annual probabilities of failure. And then we'll pull in our average life loss range. So we've got 3 to 30, or 30 to 300, 10 to 100. Now we have 3 to 30. And then 300 to 3,000 for the next two. And that should complete that. So then scrolling down, the again, the toolbox will use the geometric mean of each of those inputs. And then we'll calculate the annual probability of failure, the average annual life loss, and then the weighted average incremental life loss, the same way we've done through all the modules of the course um, to get this set of values here. And then that'll get resolved into um, an order of magnitude range, so we'll plot it as a box, both for our APF and our average life loss. So if we did this right, our FN chart or SQRA matrix would look something like this. And again, we plot things on the levy side in relationship to the uh, non-breach as well. So our um, our guidelines are not just as simple as the average annual life loss guideline. We also do want to compare it to the non-breach risk as well. So within this tab, there are uh, drop-downs to show the different reference lines and things like that. Look at all of them, the traditional ones, and then again, the controlling ones. All right, so then from there, We've got one more sheet to fill out. It would be for the economic risk. Again, we've got our range for APF that already is linked back to the, the prior worksheet. We just need to add in our average economic cost. So scrolling over here, first one is a billion to 10 billion. Second one is 300 million to 3 billion. Same for the next one. And then the next two are going to be 1 billion to 10 billion. So I'll just copy and paste those in instead of using the drop down. All right. So we get our, again, our average annual economic cost there. Apparently, I just opened Google Earth. So we've got. All right, and our um, economic risk matrix should look something like that. Any questions there? Uh, yes, Damon. Uh, I have a question about, you know, how to put the value for the overtopping. Uh, go back okay. to, yeah. Go back to the table, like for the overtopping. Uh, Row 16 in the table. Yep. So let, let's take a step back. So what, what's going on is if we go back to our levy overtopping life safety risk tab, we inputted a system response curve for overtopping. 
we're basically doing a more quantitative assessment on overtopping. So we have inputs for the overtopping depths. We have the corresponding system response probabilities for those depths. And then what the spreadsheet's going to do, it goes through and does all the calculations to get the annual probability of failure and average annual life loss associated with overtopping, yes. just like we would have done back in module two. So then scrolling down, you'll notice I get an APF of nine times 10 to the minus five. That's this number right here. And then I also get a average life loss value of 192, which is this value right here. I so cannot both see the, your test and ruling. Uh, can you just mention the row you are talking about? Okay. okay. We good? Um, yeah, I think so. So again, basically spreadsheets taking, we're, we're putting inputs in a prior worksheet. It goes through and does the quantitative calculations for overtopping with breach. And then both the total incremental life risk and economic risk worksheets pull that value in directly from that other sheet. See, okay, got it, thank you. So if I had selected yes for overtopping with breach, breach being non-credible, we basically exclude that failure mode and it makes it zero. But we have it in this case, so we want to include it so that the correct selection would be no there. If you put yes, what would be your number for the overtopping with breach? What would be my number? Yeah, for the overtopping with breach, if you say yes, what would be the range for the annual probability of the failure and average? So, so if, if you choose that to be yes, you're saying that overtopping with breach is non-credible. You're saying that the annual probability of failure for overtopping is zero. Okay. So if I pick okay. yes, it is basically excluding that failure mode and that, those fail that failure mode is not carried forward anywhere through any of the remaining calculations. Right, right. Okay, got it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, Go ahead. I've been looking at uh, Levy overtopping life risk, the uh, incremental risk estimate plot that you choose reference lines. Mm -hmm. uh, you get a pick traditional, and traditional corresponds to the uh, tolerable risk guidelines. When you look at correspond life. So that correspond, this is the average annual life loss guideline. This is the annual probability of failure guideline for dams. We used to plot that, but that's been taken off all our risk plots now. And then you said on the economic risk. Yeah, if you look at the corresponding plot on the economic risk, which is uh, SQRA non-breach risk, esc oh, no. It's the one below that SQRA incremental risk estimate lets you show re uh, reference lines. And if you choose all of them, what's the what's the verbal description of overtopping and then the green line on uh, non-breach? Those so are just the again, corresponding it's, it's, economic lines? It is corresponding to, so this is the average economic cost associated with non-breach, and then this is the annual probability for non-breach. So you're just comparing the two together. This is the um, annual probability of overtopping there. 1.18 times 10 to the minus four. Okay, so these lines are unique to these data points. Yes. But it's not, yeah, okay, thank you. All right, so once we have all that input, the last thing to check, and the worksheet will do the rest of this stuff for us, is looking at uh, accreditation and evaluation for NFIP. 
So the first value it pulls is the annual probability of failure, which we get to 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4. And then if you remember, we need to pull out the annual probability of failure for overtopping. That is our 9 times 10 to the minus 5. So we get our um, probability of failure prior to overtopping. We'll subtract those two numbers, and I'll get, again, 5.2 times 10 to the minus 5. And then our probability of inundation due to overtopping without breach, we've already calculated to be uh, 1.18 times 10 to the minus 4. So we can add those two numbers together to get our total mean annual probability of inundation, which is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 4. And then, again, the, the spreadsheet will look at what that value is. We'll plot in, um, and depending on where that value falls, we'll recommend accreditation or not. So the if we are in between, I'll go ahead and override these. If we're in between 10 to the minus um, 3 and 10 to the minus 2, say 5 times 10 to the minus 3, then it will be inconclusive. If we are less than 10 to the minus 3, like we are here, then we would recommend accreditation. And then if we are greater than 10 to the minus 2, we would not recommend accreditation. So for our homework, we were right around 2 times 10 to the minus 4, which is less than 10 to the minus 3. So we would recommend accreditation. Okay. Any questions on that? So that's really it. So once you start getting into SQRAs, the, ca the calculations are not all that complicated, um, especially if you understand how uh, the quantitative calculations work. We're just taking order of magnitude ranges and, you know, finding the midpoint the centroid, the geometric mean, and then running those calculations all the way through. And then on the levy side with NFIP, we have to do a couple things to um, get the annual probability of inundation instead of annual probability of failure. So from what I saw, the vast majority of you got this 100% correct, which was good to see. Um, if there's no other questions on the homework, Let's talk about, I guess, the rest of the course and what we need to kind of complete things and to close things out. So to get credit for this course, and again, if you complete this, we'll, you'll get up to 30 professional development hours. Um, to complete it, we need to make sure that we've completed the homework for all seven modules, um, have either um, watch the video or participate in the live Q&A, which gave you the buzzword that you then input uh, in the Socrative quizzes. And then the final thing would be to make sure that we pass the multiple choice exam, which I'll talk about next. And the passing grade is going to be a 75% a on that. And then once I talk about the final exam, I'll go through and I'll show um, what I have in terms of um, homework submittals and stuff like that. So if, see if you're missing something, um, you can get that turned in, or if my records are incorrect, you can resend those and I'll get that updated. We'll do that in a minute. So as for the final exam, that's going to show up on Socrative, kind of like what we've been doing for the quizzes. Um, uh, the room name for this one is going to be DLS 105R7. And then you'll have the spot where you put your name in, just like we've done before, and then that'll let you into the final. Um, there are 25 questions, a mixture of multiple choice and true-false. You'll note that a lot of the questions will be very familiar or similar to those that we had on the quizzes um, throughout the course. So there shouldn't be any big surprises. Um, you can take the final exam as many times as you want. Uh, when you're when you're finished, you'll get your um, your percentage, how many you got right, uh, but you won't get any feedback on the which questions you missed or whatever. 
and go from there. A any questions on the final exam? Um, sorry, what's the due the, date? For the, what's the due date? Um, I think. So. Let me look that up. I should. It's in the. Um, there should be no calendar. Your participant workbook, but I think it's like mid June, so you should it's have a few June weeks 13th. to get that done. June thirteenth. Yeah. Thank you. Thank June you. June thirteenth. That's what my calendar shows too. June thirteenth. Yeah, okay. All right. Very good. So can no, we do it before looking. that, or can we do it before that? Oh or yeah, for sure. Be? Yeah. Yes. So you have between oh. now and then to get that done and complete. Oh, okay. And good. then. If for whatever reason, you know, somebody's on an extended vacation or whatever, there's there's a little bit of flexibility there, but you should have plenty of time to get through that. Thank you. Any other questions on the final exam? Should be fairly straightforward. So sorry, just to clarify, the DLS 105R7 is what you, that's going to give you the final exam rather than the Q&A session. Right. This. Okay. Correct. So there's no buzzword for the, this Q&A. No, no. Correct. Yeah, there, there's no buzzword for uh, module seven. It's just go complete the exam and get a high enough percentage and pass it and then that'll be it. Okay. Thank you. So with that, in terms of what I have in my records for course completion, so I'll kind of scroll through this. If you see your name and it is highlighted in green, that means according to my records, I, you, you've completed all the homeworks and completed all the quizzes up through uh, homework seven. If you don't, if your name is in white, you can kind of look and see, you know, which things are missing. And, you know, you've got basically to the end of the course, that June 13th date to get those completed, as well as um, completing the final exam. So I'll um, slowly. That can you see I'm, all hold this spreadsheet? I don't see my name. I, I think, Roy, I think you can here. only see up to C. So I don't know if you can make it bigger or full screen so that those of us with the last name after C can, can see our Yeah, scroll. we're getting there. I'll okay. start I'll start scrolling. I was zoomed out so if people were missing stuff they could see what they were missing, but mm -hmm. and I'll tell you what, I'll I'll have Taylor send this out. So that you can double check. Yeah, it just looks like your screen's frozen and it's like smaller than full screen for some reason. Yeah, it shows. Um, yeah, it shows like till row seven oh. nineteen. Okay. I see. Well, let's stop. Let's stop sharing, and I'll try to share now, it again. See if that now, works. now it's full screen. It just went full screen. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. All right. And, and actually, Damon. During your presentation today, there were a few times that looked like things kind of froze on it because your your discussion oh. was beyond where your screen was. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Trying to run off a cell phone at the moment, I'm not in the office. All right. Well, let me try that one more time. Share screen, entire screen. We see a whole sheet right now. Not yet. It's Not still yet. starting to share content. So while we're waiting, Damon, I'll ask because um, we just touched on SQRAs at the end, and most of what we did was for QRAs. I guess does the the core. Um, they typically do SQRAs as part of their comprehensive assessments. I guess that's the first part of my question. And then in your experience, how often does uh, an SQRA get carried forward to a QRA uh, based on your, you know, the time that you've been with the core? So our comprehensive assess, we, we refer to them as periodic assessments. So every 10, every five years, um, there'll be a, 
periodic inspection and then every 10 there'll be a periodic assessment which is a more rigorous inspection with a risk assessment tied to it um, so basically we're, we're still working i think we've gotten through most of the inventory now but um always start at the sqri le level it tends to be the i guess the more simplest less rigorous risk assessment and then from there it really kind of depends on the structure and where it is there's been several that have gone through to quantitative assessments so if you're familiar with um, safety action classifications for um, the core we call them our DSAC ratings so anything that depending on where the risk plot anything that plots you know within a or gets assigned a DSAC 3 or worse DSAC the lower the number the more uh, risky the more um, I guess the more risky the project is so anything from one to three would go to a quantitative assessment um, DSAC fours and fives typically don't get one it's not that they that we won't do them on those it's just a lower priority and then you kind of work your way through the inventory going through the um, the riskiest um, highest priority projects first and then go from there based on your resources so anytime there's like a a major incident or something like that then you know, those risk assessments would get um, revisited you know that incident would get scoped out and checked a risk assessment would be updated and then decisions would be based on those risk assessments okay. does that answer your question no, yes, for sure. Um, I guess, you know, I, it sounds like a certain percentage. Yeah, I was curious about certain percentage, but that's that's very helpful. Um, uh, you know, I think with FERC, we just put out new guidance, but and that's largely mirrors <laughs> the Bureau and the Corps. We just, of course, changed some of the terminology. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But, uh, but uh, so, and then I guess as a follow up, so if it's D set, D cert four or five, when you look in the NID, does that they do you only publish quantitative risk in the NID, or is it just, uh, or is it does it also include SQRA level studies? In the NID, I honestly don't know that question. Okay, I don't know the answer. To that. I would have to check for you. Okay, no, that, no problem if you don't know. I just was curious. So. Right on. No, I haven't. It's been a long time since I've, I probably need to, but it's been a while since I've poked around through the NID. I know they got the scorecards and stuff. That's typically what I look at, but I didn't know if they actually posted results or what. Yeah, it, it, I think it may be pretty recent that now they, there's a risk for core projects. There's a risk tab and there's usually a little a blur. Um, if they didn't, you know, no risk assessment was performed in a, with an explanation or and no inundation maps were developed or or there is and then there's some information, but it, which, you know, based on a risk assessment, I just was wondering what informed that. But I think that's pretty recent that that stuff has become public. Um, I'm I following it. I, I, I don't know that it was much longer ago, but I could be wrong. Gotcha. Based on what you're describing, it would seem like it's any and all risk assessments that go through, whether it be SQRA or quantitative, because they will do the the mapping and the modeling and the consequences for, you know, all the different sets and that's helpful data to have out there. But I'll double check for you. Well, this is somewhat unrelated to the discussion here, but um, how many students started versus how many are finishing here, please? It looks well, like we had a pretty good drop percentage over. Well, so 50, it looks like 54 people completed homework one and quiz one, and then through quiz three and four, we're in the around 40 or so. 
So there was a number of people who didn't who signed up and then just never started. Right. So maybe 10 or 12 total, but some of them have told me that they're going to work on it and try to get it finished before the end of the course had stuff come up. So we'll have to kind of wait and see on the end there. Yep, yep. I'm sure we could we could calculate the risk of people dropping this out, dropping out of this. And... <laughs> yeah, we certainly could. <laughs> right, yeah. Just just a fun exercise, so. Right on. No, I mean, you should be proud of yourself for sticking with it to the very end. I appreciate it. I mean, I know it's not the easiest course to keep up with because of how we've set it up, but I also find a lot of value in how it's set up because, you know, a, it allows you to kind of work at your own pace, and then B, it's, I, I think you retain it better, you know, with the way things are spaced out, because you kind of oh, have to sure. remember from one module to the next instead of one day to the next, and then, you know, you get to the Friday of a week-long course, and then it's just done after that. So um, right. uh, you'll have an opportunity to – go ahead. Oh, no, go ahead. I'll, I'll let you finish. I was going to say, you'll, everybody will have an opportunity to talk about or to um, to rate and to give comments on uh, the course and the course format. Uh, there'll be an email sent out here probably either at the end of this week or early next um, for course feedback and evaluation. And I was, I was going to say, yeah, I really learned a lot about this. You know, we've had these discussions a lot. and. Yep. Understanding how to calculate the average annual life loss and the annual probability of failure, all of that has been some voodoo, but I have a much better understanding of the voodoo now. Right and I, I really appreciated, you know, the, the breaks where, you know, we finished one module and none of the work was posted, you know, until five days later. That was nice to have, you know, some forced uh, weekends off. So, right thank on. you. <laughs> You're welcome. I appreciate the feedback. Thank you, Damon, for your patience. You are great. Uh, I really appreciate that. Same here. I learned a great deal. Uh, I was new to this, you know, stuff. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Thank you, Roya. Yeah, I would echo that. First of all, uh, thank you for your flexibility and, you know, willingness to accommodate us. Uh, I guess we all have day jobs and thank you for putting in the time on your end because I'm sure it's an extra effort on your part outside of what your what your day job entails too. So, um, you know, thank you for your effort and yeah, I certainly learned a lot too. Uh, and then I guess uh, if we're missing, if, if we notice we're missing a few things in the spreadsheet, what's the best way to follow up with you on that? Should I just uh, now or do it separately? Uh, um, email is probably email is probably the best way to do it, um, and send it through the RMC training website again or the email address. I keep checking that and go from there. And then if we have trouble resolving something, yeah, by all means, give me a call. We'll figure it out. Okay. Yeah, because it seemed like there was a quiz missing that um, that I that I should have had. And actually, I just logged in, I typed in the quiz five and the first question says, select the module four buzzword. So I don't know if there's something <laughs> there, uh, you know, cause I was like, I'm pretty sure I did that. So um, I, okay. yeah, I don't know, but I don't, I don't know if maybe that's a goof or, or if not, but. Uh, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll double check on that. I, I actually don't get to see the Socrative results that goes through HDR, but we'll we'll double check and get with you and make sure you get credit for that. Okay. All right. Well, I'll shoot an email off then like you suggested and then go from there. So, okay. Sounds good. That might also, that might, I, I mentioned it too, because if there's some people that are trying to scramble to finish at the end, you know, they, they might run into that same problem too. So. Right. Well, I guess at this point, I was pretty consistent in giving the buzzword at the end. So, worst case scenario, sifting through the video to find the word and get that in, that would probably do it. But I'm yeah. trying to give you the people the answer or, you know, 
<laughs> well, cool. If if nobody's got anything else, again, really appreciate your participation, and I enjoyed the the thoughtful questions and everybody working hard to try to understand this stuff. I know it's not super easy if you're not very familiar with um, dam and levee safety risk assessment. So I, again, I appreciate all your hard work over the last oof, five, almost six months now. Um, and again, the final exam is posted. I think everybody will do great on it. And if any questions come up, by all means, let me know and we'll go from there. So thanks again for everything, guys. Well, thank you. We, we appreciate all the effort you put into it, and you certainly have a lot of knowledge in here. And if we're probably just got a small percentage, but we appreciate everything you've conveyed. <laughs> thank you very much.